And there we go. Right. We'll start the recording to make sure we are good and set to go. I see some people trickling in to the Zoom room. Welcome, welcome. Um, we'll give it a few minutes. I'll do my introductions um, and we'll introduce our panelists and our moderator for this evening in just a bit. Um, I'd like to say hello and welcome everyone. My name is Sophie Hinch and I'm the Education and Public Programs Coordinator at the Art Gallery of Windsor. And we're so glad that you're all tuning in on a Thursday evening <laughs> um, for this really important discussion. Um, we're glad to have you. So thank you for being here. Um, on your screen, you should see this beautiful image of our Look Again Outside project that you might have seen pop up uh, in different locations around downtown Windsor. I'm sure we'll talk about it or it might come up during the discussion, who knows. Um, but just as we're getting settled, grab some uh, coffee, some water, make some tea, get co comfy and cozy. Um, you're in for a really great discussion this evening. Um, I'll show again just some a few more pictures while we wait for a few more people to show up. Um, we'll give it maybe one more minute before I do my introductions, kind of go through some housekeeping items, and we'll get started in just a bit. Um, I will start off by saying that this uh, is being recorded this evening just for our prosperity and it will also live on on our YouTube channel. So if you really enjoyed this discussion or if you'd like to share it with a friend, uh, you can always do so that way by sharing a link on YouTube. I'll also mention that for accessibility, the closed captionings uh, is turned on um, so you can follow along um, as we speak. And I see in the chat already some excitement. Thank you for being here, everyone. I'm also very excited. And we've got one last image, a sneak peek of our Look Again Outside project, um, where we are showcasing reproductions of some really great treasures from the AGW collection. Um, so it's kind of like a treasure hunt. You have to find, we won't tell, the, tell you where they are exactly. You'll have to find them. <laughs> Um, but thank you uh, again, everyone, for being here. And it's 7.03 and we'll get this show on the road. Um, so welcome everyone and welcome to Drawing the Line, uh, Creative Spaces and Places. And this is our second community conversation. And this is a really important topic. Um, and we look forward to possibly hosting part two in the new year. Um, this is a really important conversation that's happening in and around Windsor at this time. Um, and just to give a, a little bit of background on this talk, why are we hosting this talk? Um, meaningful public art can showcase the spirit of a city, turning city space into a creative space, whether through murals, sculptures, signs, or more, can add extra vibrancy to spaces that otherwise would be passed by. But if community members don't connect their, city, their city's public art, should it even exist? Who should decide on where the art goes and what gets displayed? And who should be kept in mind when public art is being installed in a city? So those are some questions that we might get to throughout the evening. Uh, just a quick agenda to see how the event or the talk, the conversation, will happen this evening. We'll start with our land acknowledgement because as we're talking about places and spaces, it's important to acknowledge um, whose land this is and whose land we get to live and work and play on every day. We'll touch on our pillar of creating conversation and what does that mean? We'll introduce our moderator and panelists for the evening. I will also launch our Zoom poll. We've got some questions for you all, uh, all the attendees here tonight. We'll jump into the discussion. We'll have a Q&A portion, and then we'll conclude with our second Zoom poll. So I'll jump in uh, to our first item, which is the land acknowledgement. Uh, so the Art Gallery of Windsor respectively acknowledges that we are located on, on Anishinaabe territory the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. 
And today, the Anishinaabe of the Three Fires Confederacy are represented by Walpole Island First Nation. And we want to state our respect for the historical and ongoing authority of Walpole Island First Nation over its territory. And wherever you may be tuning in from, we encourage you to do the same. Whose land are you on? And take a moment of gratitude and acknowledgement. I also mentioned that we are here to create conversations. We're here to provoke conversations through our exhibits and programs and introduce different ways to look at, think about, and make art. We're here to activate our collection in ways that make our artworks relevant, accessible, and compelling to audiences. And we're here to inspire artistic innovation by becoming a center for creative, collaborative exploration and a magnet for inventive makers and thinkers. So that is our goal um, for this evening is to really foster a space to have these important conversations. And before I pass it over and introduce our moderator for this evening, I will launch our first poll and you should see it appear on your screen and I'll just move it out of the way here so I can see everyone. Um, but we always like to start with a poll to kind of gauge and kind of take the pulse of the room. Um, so the first question that we see here is, I consider my city a creative city. You can answer yes or no. And the second question is, I think my community has a good variety of public art. Yes or no. And the last question is, I feel uh, like the public art in my community brings people together, yes or no. So I'll just give it one more minute here. I see some answers trickling in, some interesting results. We'll give it a, a couple more seconds here. Hopefully everyone has submitted their answers. And I think that's good. We'll end the poll here. And I will share the results on your screen. Um, so you can see here kind of where people are at and we'll redo this poll at the end um, of the conversation to see if your perspective may have changed. Um, we have some really great panelists here um, that are gonna make a really good case for public art in Windsor and in the area. Um, so I'll stop sharing the poll, but some interesting results here, kind of split here um, between both. And I will also X this out here and introduce our moderator for this discussion. Um, we're so grateful to have Craig here. This is the second conversation that Craig has uh, moderated for the Art Gallery of Windsor. Craig Pearson is the managing editor of the Windsor Star and a longtime daily journalist and educator. He has worked as a journalist for 35 years and for the last 31 years at the Windsor Star. The Montreal native has covered arts and entertainment and city hall and everything in between, served as a war correspondent in Afghanistan and has won numerous awards, including as a co-winner of the National Newspaper Award Citation of Merit for the Windsor Star's 2014 Gun Running Series. He has taught journalism part-time at the University of Windsor for 22 years and is the author of two From the Vault books based on Windsor Star photos. He has hosted many community, community events and has moderated various panel discussions. We're so happy to have you here, Craig. Thank you so much. I'll pass the mic over to you to introduce our panelists for this evening. Well, thank you, Sophie, for that <clears throat> very nice introduction. And hello and welcome everyone to Drawing the Line, Creative Spaces and Places. As Sophie said, it is the second uh, community conversation that the Art Gallery of Windsor has hosted. And I am uh, thrilled to be back as moderator for this one as well. Uh, the community conversation series allows the gallery to go beyond its walls, which is just a great idea, and to discuss issues of the day. <clears throat> this one's going to be a particularly good one, obviously, because when we're talking about public art, we're talking about a dissection 
uh, of um, creativity and current affairs, which is something I'm into. Uh, given that, I might be the Windsor Star editor now, but I was a long time arts writer. And I can tell you, I love art and I like, just like how it makes people think and see and feel. So this one's going to be a good one. We're going to talk about uh, good public art, but we might even talk a little bit about how sometimes public art faces criticism. We're going to get to all that and more. I can't wait. I hope you can't wait either. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Shane Potvin got involved in Ford City in 2017 when he purchased the building located at uh, 1000 Droulard Road, now the Grand Cantina, very cool restaurant, I might say. During an extensive renovation of the second story, Shane joined the BIA and became the chair of the board in January of 2019. His prime goal is to create a unique visitor destination while attracting and connecting new businesses to the neighborhood. Shane is also the founder of a boutique graphic design studio called Spotbin Design Co., also located in Ford City. Valerie Dawn is a local architect leading a team of 12 designers at Gloss Arch and Eng, or perhaps it's Gloss Arc and Eng. <laughs> Her professional career began in Toronto and has slowly traveled westward. She brings to Windsor her passion for human-centered places and design processes deeply rooted in authentic community engagement. Recent projects include the Windsor Civic Esplanade, the Walpole Island Cultural Community Center, and the new School of Business and Esports Arena at St. Clair College. And Heather Grondin has 20 years of experience in communications, strategic planning and delivery prior to joining Windsor Detroit Bridge Authority as the Vice President of Corporate Affairs and External Relations. She was the Senior Manager of Communications and Issues Management at the Ontario Ministry of Transportation, leading the communications and consultation efforts for the Right Honorable Herb Gray Parkway and the Manager of Corporate Communications with Public Works and Government Services Canada, Ontario Region. Heather leads an integrated team of strategic planning, policy, and outreach professionals to deliver a robust and dynamic communications program for the Gordie Howe International Bridge Project. Well, you obviously all have uh, tremendous credentials for this community conversation. So thank you very much for joining us. By the way, if any audience member has a question they might like to ask, please, uh, feel free to put that in the chat box on this Zoom meeting, and uh, we'll try to get that get to that if we have time at the end of the conversation as well. And so now it is time. Let's get ready to rumble. I'd like to start the uh, discussion with the first question, and that is simply, what does public art add to a community? And maybe Shane can start. Uh, thanks, Craig. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's, I think it runs really deep. Um, you know, being in a neighborhood in Ford City, our neighborhood has had, you know, been blessed with lots of public art since the beginning. Um, or going back at least 20 years, the city invested a lot of time and energy and money into, you know, even when the neighborhood was kind of downtrodden, you know, that was filled with public art. And then over the years, we've seen this you know, build on this canvas and layers and layers and layers of new new artworks with some old artwork. And, you know, we're starting to see, you know, we're starting to see that come back in spades because, you know, people like to be around creative spaces. And I think, you know, our neighborhood is unique where it, you know, we have infill, we have some, you know, rundown buildings, but we have new buildings, we have, you know, patio spaces. But I think around that is this really unique tapestry of, of public art, whether it's the alleys on the main streets, on sides of buildings, um, you know, and those, those spaces are changing because buildings are getting renovated. And then, you know, you have maybe what was a piece of art is half modified. Um, that just lends to, I think it just lends to a dynamic environment. And that obviously, I mean, you know, we see that people wanna be around that. And I think that's the same case for everywhere in the city. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that uh, people like to be around creative spaces. I, I feel like your uh, renovating the building that became the Grand Cantina also helped attract people to it, other businesses, I think. It seemed like it was the start of it, so that was very cool. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, how about Heather? 
Yeah, I think um, public art, it's an opportunity to reflect um, the importance of a space to uh, create a memory, um, reflect on um, the importance of a specific area and really to reflect the character of a community. Um, you know, you can walk by a piece of public art and it can really reflect either that specific space or the space around it um, and without words, just able to, able to see that character. And it should, we should note, given that you're with the Gordie Howe International Bridge, that uh, the bridge has actually embraced some art. It has some indigenous art on the structure mm -hmm. that's going up. And I think I, also uh, you have contributed money to some uh, arts projects as part of the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. No, that's excellent. Yeah. Uh, Valerie, what do you think? I think the uh, the life and vibrance has already sort of been touched on, um, but I wanted to just note the the shorthand that public art brings to this sort of sense of, to use a real estate term, um, like pride and ownership. It's sort of the meta version of someone putting a pot of plants out in front of their shop or on their front step. It's like something that it doesn't matter how downtrodden and crazy everything is around it. You see public art and you're kind of like, oh, somebody cares here. Somebody's paying attention. Somebody really wants this to be a good place. And it almost gives... Uh, a sense of dignity to everything around it and a sense of um, you want to believe in the place more because you can see that people care. Um, and like Heather mentioned, it's it's nonverbal. Like you can you can see that and think that without it ever actually ever processing through your uh, logical mind. It just all happens all at once, which is kind of neat. Cool, cool architecture, which I guess Gloss uh, Arc and Eng does is, is, is a form of public art if the building is really special, in my opinion. So that's another thing. Anyway, so here's one. Who should decide on where public art goes and what gets displayed? Shane. Um, I don't. I don't even know if that's a. Uh, that's a tough question because I don't. I don't necessarily think. I think good public art, um, as I mentioned, you know, say Ford City, the, the the you know city spent a lot of money to you know, in a grant to put all this, you know, beautiful airbrush artwork in, in the neighborhood. Um, and that helped, right, to build this. But I think, you know, as a neighborhood grows or as a city grows, I think what makes public art so unique is that it is driven by individuals that are driven by their own loves and, and you know, uh, whether it's leather, love and art or just anything, whether it's fashion or architecture or uh, newspapers, um, you know, it's, it, everyone has a different reason to why they want to do art or hire someone to do art for them. And so, I mean, I don't necessarily believe that it should be driven by, I mean, everyone has the right to do whatever they want with their space. <clears throat> um, you know, and graffiti is not necessarily, you know, there's a whole other world of graffiti that's, you know, about putting your art in spaces that, you know, it's not really intentional or it's not asked for. Um, but I think, I think there's a fluidity to it that I think that's what makes it so special, right? There's signage and there's billboards that, you know, go places and people put things there. But I think having spaces that can organically grow based on, you know, who is there at that time. And I think, I think that's really important because it does, you do build on it. And cities with a lot of, you know, beautiful outdoor creative spaces and artwork, you know, it's like a beautiful art piece and then it changes and then someone paints over it and then someone paints over it. And every five years, it's a completely different uh, thing. And that that is art in itself. So um, anyways, I, I yeah, I, I think it just needs to be uh, fluid. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that uh, the art should come from people naturally to some degree. The problem though, is that you typically can't have sort of a grand space for public art without right. you know the municipality you have to, or something to be intentional right right or yeah, you're going to yeah. pay for you know like the the building the compu uh, where building in downtown detroit i mean you know there's a giant obey shepherd ferry mural on the back of that like that's probably cost a hundred thousand dollars to put on the building um you need i think you need both right you need you need the intentional stuff but then you need the stuff that's more ad hoc and and done on a whim yeah you need both Heather, what do you think about how we decide where to get, where to put art and what it should be? You know, I think the easy answer to that would be high traffic area, a space that could be uh, enjoyed by the greatest number of people. But 
I don't know that that's entirely the right answer because I don't, I think there's nothing more enjoyable than when you stumble upon something on the, on the unbeaten path and say, look at this amazing, this amazing piece of art, this amazing mural that you had no idea what that was there. So, um, you know, I don't think that's an easy qu question to answer. I do agree with Shane's comment about you do have a more formalized opportunity for public art. And with that come becomes rules and costs and policies and procedures that you need to follow. Um, but you have to counter that with that the more ad hoc and inspirational and um, kind of surprises that of public art that could be it's, that could decorate throughout the community. I think you need to have a balance and uh, and with that, um, the wear becomes different. Yeah, the ba balance is probably key. And mm -hmm. uh, it's something that if you have a mixture of both, probably that's gonna end up being the best. Valerie, any thoughts? Yeah, I was uh, really interested to hear Shane's answer because my first instinctive answer, well, Shane's answer was sort of in the direction of, well, nobody should decide, it should just happen. And my instinctive reaction was everybody should decide. Everyone that's impacted by it should decide. And that mostly comes from my world of um, public engagement for architecture. We do it all the time for built spaces, urban places. Um, and we consult with everyone who is impacted by the space, which is of course a very different creature than um, the spirit of a place just kind of bubbling up and like taking form on the walls. Um, I mean, assuming that it's just going to happen is assuming that the people who should have a voice, have the means and have the site and have the access and are part of the conversation and they often are not. Um, so a lot of uh, the work that I do both in buildings and in urban spaces or even sometimes um, trying to connect art into those spaces is um, trying to think about whose voice should be heard in those processes that isn't naturally a part of the decision-making process. Like who's, who's not at this table? Who do we need to talk to? And sometimes it's um, a physical neighbor. It's like, oh, this person sits like, like their building is beside this site. They're gonna see it every single day. They know things about this place that we don't. Um, sometimes it's a broader context of like people who maybe they're physically farther away, but they're really invested in the, in the success of a place and the spirit of a place. They really want the place to do well. Um, sometimes it's sort of social groups, cultural groups. It could be the LGBTQ community. It could be indigenous communities. These people have maybe no even knowledge of the site or the opportunity that might exist. Um, but if you're able to actually pull people into the conversation at the right time, usually uh, they can bring a lot of richness two things. Now that I, I believe in the both and of the answer in terms of if everything is an everyone consultation all the time, that, that's a difficult thing. And that's, um, that's something that, you know, I know the, I know the complexity of the underbelly of that creature. And um, I appreciate uh, Shane's approach of it should just bubble up and things will just appear and there'll be layers and it'll be beautiful. And that all sounds wonderful. Um, <laughs> and also within that somewhere, I want to connect to people who don't naturally have the means or the voices um, to, to have those bubble up moments. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great that you guys actually ask the community what they want. It's a different thing that what Shane was talking about, and he's talking about, hey, you know, here's a wall, let's put something cool up on there. And you're talking about building a building that's a massive structure. So you're asking. So I, I think that's both legit. I guess a corollary to that question would be uh, how much should taxpayers contribute to public art, if at all? Starting with Shane. <laughs> wow, these are so, these questions are very, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to contradict, uh, Valerie, I'm gonna have to contradict myself eventually in this, in this present <laughs> era, in this talk about what I just said, because there, you know, there is, I think there is somewhere, it's definitely somewhere in the medium. It's not, it just can't just happen. Um, uh, again, it comes to taxpayers, um, you know, we're, to answer the first part is that, you know, there is this sort of uh, organic, uh, public art is organic and graffiti and, um, you know, mural artwork, you know, it just happens sometimes. But then there's the times like, uh, um, you know, where it's organizations and they do it, you know, we're in a position where say, uh, our neighborhood, you know, we built on it. There's these layers. We've had, you know, we've had mural work that's cost a lot of money. There's, you know, been artwork that's just been thrown up. You know, we have dropped on Juilliard every year. 
And during that, we literally whitewash a bunch of walls, get a bunch of graffiti artists and paint. And so that sort of builds on it. But there does come a point where, you know, you need a little bit of control because, I mean, A, it's people's properties and you do run out of space. And so it needs to be somewhat organized for us. You know, we're in the process of, you know, kicking off what is to, to be a pretty regular uh, mural project in Ford City um, that we want to incorporate the neighborhoods. And, you know, we've, we've selected an artist that's uh, a, a artist out of, or two artists out of Toronto that are going to paint a big wall um, at Welpton and Richmond. Uh, sorry, yeah, Welpton and Richmond. And so, you know, we know that there's, it's our responsibility to take something that the nature of public art, art that people have shared, but it's, it's, it's out there. Um, we need to control that. And so not control it in like, you know, we, we're giving these artists pretty much, you know, carte blanche to whatever they want to do, but we need to make sure that our neighborhood stays fresh and we're constantly doing new things. Um, and we're, we're, you know, pushing, you know, so it keeps growing. And it, it, again, na it naturally maybe doesn't happen all the time. And artists don't just throw up art, you know, whenever they want, not at the level that, you know, the big murals and the really nice pieces. So um, when it comes to taxpayers, um, you know, it does come down to, it has to be funded, you know, for us to put artwork on a wall, we need to, whether it's, you know, BIA funds, um, which in this case is going to be, you know, I guess that somewhere down the line that, that becomes, you know, it's taxpayers, it's levy, it's property taxpayers for our membership, um, they're paying into that. Um, you know, it's a tough one. I can't really speak to like the city as a whole, you know, because it is so, it, it, there's so many pockets and it's hard to, you know, who, and you don't want the city saying, let's put up some murals around the city because then it kind of loses. It's, the city's not the right people to do it, right? The art gallery has these, you know, pop-up, you know, pieces of art around the city that feels, that feels correct, right? And so, I don't know if it's a, a public citywide thing that, you know, there's a line item on the budget for, you know, I get creative spaces that's different and not just wall art. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I can't, <laughs> that's it. I'm I just, you lost me there. I don't know what to okay. say. Well, I mean, I happen to think that there is a place for uh, taxpayers to help out with uh, public art and it happens in many ways. You know, the Art Gallery of Windsor's Outreach with the artwork around the city is one example. The bridge has another example. Anyway. Right. Yes. <laughs> Heather. Trick question. <laughs> um, you know, gov governments are charged with spending taxpayers' dollars responsibly. And I think um, the definition of that responsible expenditure of taxpayer dollars has changed over time. Um, and increasingly you see that taxpayers are demanding and looking for um, social responsibility, community benefits, um, really looking and benefiting the community through the expenditure of their tax dollars. Um, the Gordie Howard International Bridge is an example of that. Um, if this project was constructed 20 years ago, it wouldn't have had a community benefits plan in it taxpayer dollars would not have been allocated to benefiting the community because the idea would have been the new bridge is the benefit. Um, so just because it's not serving the primary pur purpose of the investment does not mean it's not a responsible expenditure of taxpayer dollars. So with that, I would say, um, should taxpayer dollars be, be allocated to, to public art? Yes in a response, physically responsible way as part of a you know, very well thought out planned process. And in this case, you know, in that case, it would follow, likely follow policies and have consultation tied to it. It would not necessarily be that more pop-up, you know, just burst of energy. It would have to be a more thought out rigorous process that would bring that because that is also an expectation of taxpayers uh, that there is a, a followed process that they can then track what led to how their money was being spent. But yeah, I think, I think taxpayers don't, I don't think they necessarily bristle anymore at the thought of their money going to a betterment within their community. No, I think you're right. And by the way, there's uh, different levels of how much 
tax can be spent. And so you have to find, again, the proper balance. But I feel that if you are spending a fair amount on something that truly beautifies a section of the city, you don't get that many people criticizing it. Now with the grand projects and you're talking many millions of dollars, that's where I think you can have uh, taxpayers rise up and say, hey, this is not right. So anyway, finding the right balance. Anyway, um, Valerie, what do you think? Um, I, as someone who is constantly trying to connect artists to spaces um, and wanting to make sure those artists are paid and not knowing necessarily how they're going to get paid. Um, I absolutely want the funding channel to exist um, because I believe that it can support really good things. Um, I, I agree with some of Heather's comments about um, the fact that it, it can be seen as a responsible use of funds um, in the appropriate way um, and that it contributes to a quality of life in the same way that streets and clean water might. Obviously, streets and clean water play a very different role in our, in our tax dollars, but um, the double-edged sword of the question is also that um, then the question becomes, well, who is the gatekeeper of what is and is not art? And I think most people would agree that the government shouldn't be it. <laughs> so can, can there be a way, I'm not an expert in creating um, politically appropriate funding channels, but could there be a way that yes, the money exists, but we actually do it in a way where um, it's not up, it, that our art and our definition of art isn't being filtered through a bureaucratic process, but does have some um, amount of rigor that Heather was speaking to that actually makes sure that it, it can be inclusive and can um, really say something and represent the people that is meant to, to represent and speak sort of the, the heart and the spirit of the place. Um, can we have both? I hope so. I'm not sure exactly how, um, but yes, I would. Yes, I want the money to go there, and I would really like the government not to be the I, great people at, in our municipality who want really great things. I believe in all of them, um, and I think that there's there should be some sort of structure to make sure that um, in the end of the day, the government isn't filtering um, what is the definition of appropriate art. All right. Um... So this one's more of a specific question, and I will be uh, interested to hear what Valerie says when we get to her. But uh, what do you think the idea? Should municipalities yeah. require developers to commit a portion of their project budget, say 1% to public art? This is something that has been tried in other cities, such as Chicago. Do you think that that has any uh, merit? And obviously, it would only be not in you know, suburban areas, but probably we're talking more about the core. Anyway. What do you think about that, Shane? Um, I think there is a social sort of responsibility for anyone, you know, developers, um, you know, these are big projects and big money and, you know, there's also big profits and, you know, and again, developing is a tough world now more so probably than it's ever been and costs go up, up, up and, and you know, uh, the cost of the houses can't go up as, as much or houses, houses specifically, but I think, um, I, I definitely think there should be some, you know, the small developers, I think it's really hard, right? Someone who buys a building, for me, for example, like, you know, I buy a kind of a rundown building and then I have to spend a small fortune to, you know, you know to renovate this space to be something that's you know, rentable and, and something that can be habitable, um, you know? Again, if it's a portion, I think it needs to it, it needs to scale, right? It needs to be if there's X percent, um, you know, for someone like me, maybe it's you know five hundred dollars a year or two hundred dollars a year, something that contributes to, you know, the the neighborhood. But then you get stuck with what what can I do? Do I put a sticker on the building and <laughs> and that's considered public art or art or um, and so, but I think that as it scales up to bigger corporations and they're doing big developments, absolutely, right? You look at, you know, you look at even the graffiti project that's gonna happen on university. I mean, that the whole project is such a beautiful project because in its core, it's a very creative project and they have creative goals out of that. And that's, you know, that wasn't made, you know, I don't think that was made for them, made, it wasn't, <laughs> sorry. They didn't have to do that, right? Because that's just that's just a deep down uh, philosophy that you know creative spaces make spaces more enjoyable for people. So um, I guess my answer is 
you know, I, I would say that's a good, you know, it's good to include that in some sort of must have for, for developers, but um, I think there's, there's gray area there. Gray area for sure. And by the way, when I was proposing that, hey, what do you guys think of this? I didn't really mean for somebody like you to have to pay every year, uh, but just when you're developing a project, it, what do you guys think about that? What do you uh, think, Heather? <laughs> well, in, in many scenarios, you'll see developers coming to a city or a municipality and receive a benefit, a tax, a tax rebate or a tax reduction mm -hmm. for into the community. Uh, they may get a great deal on land. Um, they might, might need to get uh, city council approval to move ahead with their building plans. And in those like, types of scenarios, it makes a lot of sense to bake in. Um, we're giving you something, municipality is giving you something developer. You're going to be very prosperous from this venture that you're having in our city. What are you investing back in? Um, and that type of scenario would really lend itself well for adding in requirements for public art, for saying, you know, we are giving you something. What are you giving and investing back that is something other than the thing that you're making money from? So I, I think it's, I, I think it's um, a very interesting concept. And, and you know, as, as Shane spoke, you know, you, you look at it, you scale it, you look at what's the value of the investment that the, the developers bringing in, um, what's the size and what would be a meaningful expectation for them? Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I'd mentioned when I uh, asked a question that Chicago has in the past done that. And, you know, I think you can see it to some degree in their skyscrapers because so many of them are really unique artistic approaches to what is a big, tall building. And, um, you know, some people suggest that it could be because the city of Chicago uh, required it required that you uh, propose something and it has to pass uh, a sort of an aesthetic approval as well as a functional approval. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for that. Valerie, what do you, what do you think about this one? <laughs> I agree with both uh, Shane and Heather as far as the importance of scalability. One thing that I just wanted to note that popped to mind um, when Shane raised the like, you know, what about the little guy who, you know, I mean, certainly I can connect you to a five-year-old who can give you some stellar sticker art. However, um, <laughs> yeah. something that came to mind was, uh, I mean, honestly, like for, for that scale, like there's say a tipping point where beyond this scale and, and if you're really creating this like giant cash flowing asset, there's no reason you shouldn't sort of be responsible for a portion of that serving the community. Um, but below that tipping point, um, if there was something that you even like in the same way that you pay development charges to get a, when you get your permit, um, sort of paying money into a pot. And then that pot becomes like, there might be for you, it might be this burden where it's like, I really want to do something, but it's just kind of a struggle. I'm just trying to like get this building like viable again. It's like half condemned right now, but I'm sure there's someone else in an equal situation that has a really great idea for something that's maybe like larger than um, something that they can fund, but they have the opportunity to do it. And if there was some sort of like pot that other people pay into, but is intended to be redistributed for stuff like that, maybe you could like apply to, to receive it. I'm not sure how that might work, but I feel like that would still be serving the purpose. Great, thank you. Well, here's a tricky one. There's only gonna be one or two hard questions, but uh, if community members don't connect with their city's public art, should it even exist? And should there be public recourse to have it removed? We'll start this one again with Shane. <laughs> you said that all, these are all very tough questions. These are, um, yeah, you're like pitting us against each other. Did you know that we were gonna? No, um, I, I, yeah, yeah, I feel like we're all like, each other. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, I mean, again, it's public. This is, these are, these are spaces that um, you know, and most of the public art, if it is something that's going to be, you know, paid for by corporations or cities or governments, you know, there is checks and balances and there is, you know, we have to go through a process. The city has to go through a process. There's public, you know, there's always public, um, uh, input and then, you know, there's voting and making sure that ever at least X amount of people are on board. Uh, and so I, I think for the stuff that matters the most. I think there already is some checks and balances in place that, you know, it, you don't end up with this monstrosity or something that's 
ugly and and everyone hates it and the whole city's up in arms you know i think there are people that not i mean again art is so subjective so you know um things go up and people go eh, i don't care for it i you know i don't seem we don't see that a lot in windsor i don't seem to see that a lot like you said unless it's you know the the um you know the riverfront plaza and that big you know shelter that's going to go over it and you know this people get up in arms about you know well you're gonna spend all this money on this thing and why don't you know why does it fix the homeless problem and um and i find that that's where we end up the high levels where it's really expensive projects and whether it's the beacon or that thing so um i i, I think there's enough balances in place that that it, it doesn't you know you cannot like something and it's very it, it's, it's okay and i think that's what makes art art is that you're allowed to look at something and hate it. And part of art is sometimes hating it, right? It's, it's, it's in, you know, <laughs> some sort of response that, that it, you're, you're getting from it. And maybe artists would be like, I love the fact that you hate it because I wanted you to feel something. I wanted you to maybe feel, you know, art doesn't always have to make you feel comfortable. It can make you feel uneasy or it can make you feel sad or unsettled. So, you know, I, I personally don't think, you know, if someone comes and, you know, and that I mentioned the graffiti project, that was the same thing where, you know, one person also didn't like that it could go up and it was going to block a view. And, you know, that held up a big process, that held up a big project um, for a long time. So um, I think it's weighed by who it is. And if it's one person, then I think they just have to, you know, it's, it's art and it's, it's there for everybody to either hate or love. I'm glad you mentioned those two projects on the on the riverfront because the Celestial Beacon and the uh, <clears throat> Festival Plaza Canopy are both, you know, these amazing projects in many ways, but they right. have had opposition. And yeah. some people, you know, the Canopy, for instance, there was uh, somebody quoted in the Windsor Star about calling it a monstrosity, but many other people saying, you know, it's really cool. What a cool way to transform the riverfront. So I'm glad you brought that up. It's a discussion that's been happening in the last few months in our city. And by the way, talking about what if we go to the extreme on a small one? So the graffiti artist, if you can call him that, Kurz, who yeah. tagged a bunch of things and that including on Droulard Road in your area. And mm -hmm. that's art, if it's even art, that nobody did want. And it was removed, thankfully. Right, and then I think there's enough people. And I think in any, you know, it's a democracy, right? If there's enough people that are enough in arms about something, if enough people don't like the, you know, the canopy over, I personally thought it looked really great. And I think we need more things on our riverfront that define Windsor, right? Outside of a casino. You know, I think you look at it, you go to the Renaissance Center and you look across and it's a casino and, you know, a couple smaller buildings. Um, you know, we need things that, that, that are enticing and draw people in a neighborhood from a grand scale. But yeah, I think you're right. Like, I think if, in, with regards to Kurs, you know, you had a lot of people and you pissed off a lot of people across the entire city. And, you know, that never happens, right? Artwork and graffiti art, you know, there's artists that put graffiti all over the city at, in unwanted places all the time. Um, and no one's complaining. And maybe one person complains because it's on their fence or on their house. But I mean, when you, when you, when you piss off a whole city, then, then it, it, it has weight. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you mentioned how you like how the canopy, if, if it ever goes ahead, would transform <laughs> the city. Uh, I think that's a, an important uh, element of public art. Speaking of transforming the city, a new bridge would do that, which gives us the segue. <laughs> <Good> segue. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, I think we can look at the somewhat recent history of public art and whether it's in our community or in others. There have been times where there's been missteps, um, despite consultation, despite best efforts. Um, there have definitely been those those times where people have felt that their cultures may have been misrepresented, or they hadn't had an opportunity to weigh in. And you know, responding to that that type of of feedback, I think, is extremely valid. Um, I do think, however. Um, there's the voice of the artist and it shouldn't necessarily be silenced because a group of people don't necessarily like the representation of that voice. 
I'll also note in general, um, it does seem often that the people who have a, um, a negative reaction tend to have the loudest voices. Uh, people who are happy with a piece of art don't, or with any, with any type of, of installation, don't necessarily respond. They're not the ones talking the loudest. And you do have to weigh and assess is, are those loud voices really the majority or are they just the loudest voices? And you don't necessarily need to respond to just the loudest voices. Okay, thanks very much. Valerie, it is your turn. The, uh, the thing that came to mind as you guys are speaking was just also the added layer of like, at least asking the question of, is it causing harm? Uh, Cause certainly I agree with all the comments about art is meant to make you uncomfortable and not everyone will like it. And there is a whole broad range of things that people will shout in all caps on social media about hating and it, it, it really about inconsequential things because it's not their preference or they don't like it or it's not what they would do. Um, but there really is art that can cause harm if not like in terms of, I mean, we've seen a lot of public art if we're counting monuments destroyed in the last year in very public ways because of harm. And I think harm is something that could be taken, like should be taken very seriously and um, taken sort of in a different light than sort of subjective preference. And so if something were, was to go up that was um, like frankly racist or something that was transphobic, that's something that absolutely, I think there, you know, whether or not there's enough people that are upset, I don't think that numbers really matter if it's actually um, causing harm to people in our community. Um, so, I mean, there's probably, some really difficult middle, like it, some difficult nuance to sort of extract there. But um, I wanted to raise that um, not in conflict with anything raised so far, but just as a, another side to that. Great. Thanks very much. And we'll do, <clears throat> we'll end it with my questions with a fun question. And then we'll see if there's some questions from the audience. But uh, what types of public art do you like the most? And what kind of art projects would you like to see in Windsor? We get to start with our man Shane. Um, and I, I think first and foremost, uh, I mean, I think architectural is a big one, right? I think you know, it's a not a lost art in this in in Windsor, but I'm saying when talking about this, um, you know, a lot of the I find the, a lot of the architecture in the city has been very functional for you know forever, and I mean, architectural archi architecture was functional for a long time and now it's you know it has it there is a space to convey something else like the buildings in Chicago or um and I, I feel like there needs to be a focus because a city's a city's identity you know revolves around the things that make it up and those are our monuments and our buildings and and spaces and parks and you know how a how a, a park is laid out I think is important looking at it from the sky I think you know those are those outside of and I like that you look at something you know from a drone and it's like wow that just looks amazing like you don't see that when you're at the ground level um, you see that from up top but there's something special about um, you know having that built in and that's the art that you know Valerie you know brings to the table when she builds spaces and creates spaces and and I'm an artist too but my, my art doesn't you know my doesn't art necessarily create spaces like that um, and so you know I'd like to see again I, I'd like to see us naturally you know, move in a direction and I feel like we're heading in this way where it's it has been natural and it is creating we are creating our own identity we still have a ways to go I feel I feel like we're still getting our feet wet I think Windsor as a city is is getting its feet wet in you know, kind of the grand city scale of things um you know we have Detroit next to us which I think is you know one of the best parts of Windsor to be honest is because we just have this access to you know, you go over to Detroit and it's probably one of the things I missed the most during COVID is, you know, you go there and you're just as an artist and as a person and as someone who eats food and looks at things, you know, you're just bombarded with beauty and, and, you know, they, they have this, you know, they have a culture and they have, they have an identity. Um, and, you know, we can take a little bit of that. And I think that's what we're seeing. And Ford City is that to me, in my opinion, when, you know, since I got involved, I always saw Ford City as a kind of little bit of Detroit that we got. It's only a block or, you know, it's a long street, but it, it has the same sort of energy in the restaurants. And, you know, the next couple of years will be, you know, pretty dynamic in that 
respect. So, you know, I'd like to see, I, I just want to see more of this. Like, I mean, just this, this thing happening, us talking about this is so helpful, right? Because it's, it's connecting people and it's connecting the city as a group. And then I think that shows people that it's more important. And then, then the identity comes with it. Then people start to feel like they're proud of their space because we have these things, right? You know, it's not the CN Tower, but it's it's stuff that, you know, it's a fabric. And so I guess to answer the question, I, I just want to keep the see this train um, uh, or trolley car, uh, you know, moving forward because, and again, the trolley car is another thing. Like the fact that we have this trolley car that was, you know, the first electric car made a hundred years ago, you know, is refurbished and brought back to life. There's a beauty to that. And to, to give it a home and give it a place on the river, I think that's special um, because it does deserve that. And so I, it seems like there is this, this uh, movement percolating and, you know, it, again, it's not just one thing, it's art in all respects um, that I feel like we're just getting going. Yeah, and I think what you said about Detroit is bang on. It's a very cool city. It's filled with great art and, uh, and culture. I think it does rub, rub off on Windsor. And I do think Windsor is starting to come along in that way. In mm -hmm. any case, uh, uh, Heather, what would you like to see in public art? Yeah, so, you know, I really enjoy integrated art. So, you know, a, a beautifully designed living wall, um, a mural on a wall that's just replacing you know, it doesn't need to be a mural. There's no purpose of it being a mural there, but it's enhancing the outdoor space. And I have been at the back patio of the cantina and have seen some beautiful murals. So, you know, it's it's really just that enhancement and, and integrating it into the place that you're being. And it's not there for any other purpose than to make the environment that you're in more enjoyable. Um, and, and I do think there's more and more opportunity for that, um, for looking at those unique spaces that we have um, and making them even more unique, making them more of a draw. So I'd really like to see, you know, where are those alleyways in Windsor that we can completely transform them and then turn them into something else, turn those into draws and business opportunities and turn them into the Insta Instagrammable moments that people love love to do and, and then everyone else flocks to them yeah well said and I think that Maiden Lane is an example <clears throat> of some great mm -hmm. murals as is Drewlard Road where Shane's at yeah. um Valerie what what do you like I think I have an idea of one type of uh, public art you like well, as a consumer of art, uh, probably my top of mind is experiential art, things that are interactive and playful. Um, I really love things that are, are temporary. And I think part of that comes from my world of architecture where everything is just so permanent all the time and you want it to last forever. And there's something really fun and exciting about things that really don't last forever. And they just sort of, you know, there's something that comes up and it's very experiential for a time. And then it becomes that thing that you talk about for years later. Um, and maybe we'll reemerge in a different way uh, later on. And those sorts of things are really exciting to me. Um, but on the flip side, um, as someone who is connect, trying to connect artists to spaces, um, that's where my love of murals comes in because they are so um, accessible. They're very accessible. Like you've got a wall, great. Like you can, you can hire an artist to paint a mural, but you can also work with a team in your community. I mean, you can work, I know, I know people who work with um, young children and, and have something sort of inspired by a group that ends up on the wall. Um, it's something that is so accessible and can be so personal to a space. Um, and uh, to go back to one of Shane's original points, it can be something that just kind of like bubbles up and happens with a lot less work. Um, and a lot less sort of approvals. And you, don't, you don't have to like structurally engineer anything to make it stand. Like you just slap color on a wall. And so I really like the accessibility of that. Um, but I still crave and hope we can have more of the experiential weird stuff. All right, I, I, I second that. Um, so we're gonna turn to some questions from the audience now and maybe we can do more free form if anybody has thoughts on this. Actually, this first one might be more for Sophie, but anyway. How do you engage and inform the audience about public art? For example, the pop-up reproductions from the Art Gallery of Windsor. Is there any information about this art on display or ways to inform the public considered? For example, 
an interactive website, QR codes, a mobile app, Sophie, do you feel like? Yeah, I can jump in. That's a great question. And I have it um, linked. I'll drop it in the chat here. Um, This is just, uh, it will take you to our website where you can see the locations of Look Again uh, outside uh, where we've reproduced some works from our collection. You can read up About the project, uh, we'd also like to shout out uh, the Stephanie and Barry Zuckelman Foundation uh, for making this possible. But in early 2022, um, keep your eyes open and on social media, but we will activate these reproductions of artworks through an augmented reality treasure hunt. So there will be an app. Uh, We've been uh, creating this in partnership with the Montreal-based interactive media studio uh, named Moment Factory. Um, So this digital experience will be supported by the Ontario Cultural Attractions Fund, uh, the Canada Council for the Arts, uh, Digital Strategy Fund, uh, Ontario Tourism Innovation Lab, WeTech Alliance, Tourism Windsor Essex, Peely Island, the City of Windsor, and the Downtown Windsor Business Improvement Association. So a lot of uh, shout outs there uh, to make this project possible. We just wanted to make sure that uh, we shouted out all of our partners for, for bringing this to life. Uh, but look out for this uh, new app and this new augmented reality um, treasure hunt throughout the city uh, in early 2022. So we're very excited to bring this to uh, to Windsor and to the region as well. So thanks for asking. All right, here's another one. Oh, what media uh, does the group consider as having potential public art besides sculpture, static images, signage? Is only permanent art considered as opposed to temporary or ephemeral art? What about multimedia, video, performance, interventionist, for example? Any thoughts on non-permanent works as public art and how we should treat that? Um, I'll jump on that first. Um, You know, I think if you look at the Gordie Howe International Bridge Project and the tower form artwork that we put put in place, that's temporary work. Those tower forms will be up for two years. And ultimately the idea for that came from A worker on the site said we have these massive, almost three story high pieces of, 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 you know, these, these forms that will go around our towers. We on the construction site want to look at something nicer than that for the next few years. Is that an area that we could possibly put art? And while we hope to find a permanent location for those after it's gone, uh, they're gone from the site and they're no longer needed to help with the construction of the towers. Two years and having that beautiful art to look at, temporary, but well worth it. Great. Any any other thoughts from anybody on that? Um, Another another question. I'm sorry, Shane, go ahead. No, no, I just, I I don't even know if I have a solid, a whole solid point here, but I, I think to my other point is that the more, you know, it's all important. And I think as, as, as more people start to appreciate the art around them. And I think the natural art that everyone sort of, you know, to the every person, it is it is the visual stuff that they see, like, you know, maybe the more ephemeral and the, you know, artistic and the emotion and, um, you know, maybe no one even thinks of that as something they can see in a space. Um, but to speak to what I was saying is that we're starting to see a lot more of all of it, right? Because people are starting to understand what it is, you know, whether it's a projection, um, uh, you know, projection on a building or people, you know, uh, uh, people dancing on a corner and videotaping it and watching people's reactions. I think, I think as a city grows creatively, I think those things start to naturally happen outside of, um, you know, your typical, you know, wall, you know, building structures and that's that's what i'm really excited about in windsor is that you know you're starting to see these things happen that we haven't seen in the past and or haven't seen often in the past and but that just makes more artistic you know with the art gallery you know when i grew up as a kid it was like if you wanted to see art you you just went to the art gallery that was the place that you would you absorb art we didn't have computers we didn't have phones 
you had nothing. That's where you went or, you know, saw something on TV that was programmed. So I think now um, it's everywhere. And I think the city needs to build around that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to add to um, with the whole temporary transient art. I mean, I had just spoken about how much I love it and want more of it. Um, I think it's also um, probably one of the hardest things to fund because we have this mm -hmm. like pragmatic mindset of like return on investment to say, well, you're paying this amount of money and this is what you're getting out of it. You get like years of this experience. You get this thing that is permanently on a wall and you get to look at it forever. Um, and there's something so exciting about something fleeting. Um, and yet there's often just as much effort and time and energy and money put into that. Um, and then it disappears. And so um, we have a lot of very practical minds that are like, what? <laughs> no, if I'm going to pay that amount of money for something, I want, I need it to be around um, for certainly more than a day or a season. Um, so um, yeah, like I want more of it and I don't know how to get through some of the logistical barriers to, um, to get it appropriately funded when we know how much uh, difficulty there is in funding even permanent works. So mm -hmm. um, I think there's some challenge there. Yeah, I mean, I, I like what you said about it. Some, something that's cool about it being fleeting makes it seem so special. You see it now or you don't see it at all. And I'm wondering if maybe some of the uh, festivals provide that to a certain degree. I mean, what about well, bright lights. the Windsor Film now. Festival? What's that? Yeah, I was saying bright lights happening now. Bright lights that uh, open. But yeah, with also. That's right. And uh, it's a different, you know, fireworks, fireworks displays. I mean, are these types of art? I mean, it's a limited type of art. They're not necessarily the experimental types of art, but I think it's a form of art. Some of the films can be. Anyway, those are one things to consider in terms of the fleeting or non-permanent types of art that I think absolutely add to the culture and quality of life of the city. Here's an interesting one. Could public art be used to engage younger members of the community? There are legal graffiti walls that concentrate graffiti to a controlled space that Oops, it just moved because somebody else said so. <laughs> to a controlled space that have worked in other cities. Do you think something like this could work in Windsor and avoid potential future curs like copycats? Curs again was the graffiti artist who uh, defaced many uh, buildings in town. Shane, you seem like you might want to talk about this. Oh, one. I, um, I mean, I think I think spaces like that are important. I think, you know, uh, uh, skate parks and, um, you know, those are places that, you know, maybe, you know, to ward off kids from skating downtown Windsor on, you know, public spaces or on dangerous spaces. You know, I think it's really important um, to have, to sit, have sandboxes for people to express themselves. And, you know, it can be whether it's skating and jumping, you know, jumping stairs, or, you know, you get a spray can and you want to start writing your name. And that's, I mean, you know, I, I spoke to a documentary artist in Windsor, um, Sasha Appler, who did the graffiti documentary last year. And he was really interested uh, after the Kurz thing happened. Um, and he interviewed me and he was, you know, he came at from a different perspective because he's like, there's a whole other world to graffiti where it's, you know, you have to just practice, practice, practice. You, you write your name a million times and then you fill it in and then you do that a bunch of times and so you do it all over the place. Um, and so there is a, there, there is logistics to graffiti art that you need more spaces and you need to, it's, it's like drawing, it's muscle memory. Like you literally just have to do it over and over again. And so I think, you know, rather than you doing it all over the city, it's great to have a space. Maybe someone will use that a lot, but then there's another side to you know, some graffiti art where it's not necessarily just about art. It's about, you know, some of it is about being destructive and some of it is about putting it in places where people can see it. Um, so I, I definitely believe there should be sandboxes for, um, uh, you know, for people to, to practice um, and, you know, practice their craft. But I think you'll never, you'll never ward off of someone like a Kurz, for example, because that wasn't, the, the reason he did that is not, you know, because he was didn't have anywhere to do it. Like it was, it was beyond, and there was multiple reasons, I believe. So, anybody else wanted to jump in on that one? Thoughts on creating a space for young people to 
to public art? Perhaps a consideration, and maybe this is in a more um, formal public art creation environment, um, is mentorships. So having artists who have been um, been engaged to create specific art as part of that it is engagement is the requirement um, to have a young artist work with you, to shadow the artist, to be mentored by the artist, to contribute to that work. Um, that could be a way to, uh, to bring in a young artist and expose them to the world of public art. Anybody else? So, Sophie, I mean, doesn't the Art Gallery of Windsor to some degree do do that in a, sort of a limited thing? And sometimes don't you have spaces for people to do art there? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm quite new still to the Art Gallery. I started in the midst of the pandemic. So I've only just done virtual programming and we're just starting to get back to in-person programs. And we've really seen an interest from our community. They want experiences, they wanna learn, they wanna connect with others through art, whether it's through murals or interactive uh, art projects, whatever that may be. Uh, so we're starting to plan out uh, next year, 2022, and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more opportunities for not only artists to connect with the community, but the community to connect with artists and support support those artists in our community as well. Um, but I've been taking notes all evening <laughs> and I can't wait to um, host part two of this conversation because I, so much has been said this evening. Um, but yeah, this was a, a great conversation. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks very much. Um, I think that's, we've come more or less to the end of the question. So I just like to thank everybody for uh, participating, all the panelists, of course, uh, Sophie, and all the audience members too. It, it, there were, I, I didn't see any more questions, but there were actually quite a few statements. People were very involved in the conversation. So I didn't read the statements out because it wasn't quite a question, but it's an interesting discussion right there. And maybe hopefully, if I don't know if there's any way for you to incorporate, Sophie, the, the statements and questions that people uh, provided with the link that you'll have for this. No, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us, for drawing the line. And I pass it back to the very capable Sophie. Excellent. Again, thank you, Craig. Um, you're an excellent moderator. And thank you to our panelists. Um, as I said, I was taking notes all evening. I saw some of my colleagues uh, watching at home, so I'm sure they were <laughs> writing some things down as well. We will definitely save the chat because a lot of great points were being made um, in the chat as well. And we're just coming to the end of our conversation. Um, I'm going to launch now the second part of our poll to see whether your points of view may have changed. Um, so you'll see it um, hopefully in a little bit. I've just got to launch it here. So you should see it appear on your screen. So again, we're asking the same questions, but we're really curious to know if your point of view might have changed after listening to our panelists um, talk. Uh, so I'll let it run for a little bit, but we'd love to hear uh, everyone's thoughts uh, to see if after listening to this conversation, do you consider your city um, a creative city? Is it more creative by, than I initially thought? Um, the second question being, after listening to this conversation, I would enjoy seeing more displays of public art in my community. And then the third question, which is a really interesting question, um, after listening to this conversation, what can be done to create public art displays that bring people together? And you can check um, multiple choices. So we can either invest in public art, seek out input from community members, consult with art galleries and or artists, or consult grassroots organizations, we can engage with nonprofit and uh, non-government organizations, or you can either um, write your own response as well. And I just saw um, Craig as well. <laughs> art does rock. In the, um, I agree, art really does rock. 
So I'll give it just a couple more seconds here for people to submit their answers and we'll see um, if, if it's a little different. All right, we'll give it a few more seconds. I think we've got all of our answers. I'll end the poll now. And I will share the results so we can see um, how the different, mm. um, the difference here in answers. So um, pretty split between the first question here. Um, and after listening to this conversation, I would enjoy seeing more displays of public art in my community. I think that's something we can all agree on. So that's really great to see 100%. And the third question as well, um, I think everyone is just interested in just seeing more art in general. It makes uh, a lot of difference in our communities. So thank you everyone for participating in this poll. We're definitely going to keep these results um, and see if we can work as an organization with our community uh, to make this a reality. Um, and I will also, just before we say goodbye uh, for today, I'll share my screen again. And you should see on your screen, we wanna keep this conversation going. Um, there's lots of ways to engage with the Art Gallery of Windsor. Uh, you can visit us online at agw.ca to see what we've got coming up. We're already starting to share what exhibitions we've got planned for next year, for 2022. We're always updating uh, our events. There's great artist talks, community conversations, workshops, opportunities for you to get involved. You can also follow us on social media at agw401. Uh, we've also got some great memberships um, we have a new membership fee structure. So uh, you can get a free membership if you are an artist in Windsor or just an artist in general, wherever you may be, you can get a free membership to come to the Art Gallery of Windsor and engage with us. Um, and if you're a youth under 25 years old, you can also get a free membership. Uh, so come and visit us at the AGW and we're always working to bring our collection um, and our works of art out into the community. So be on the lookout for Look Again Outside. We encourage you to, to find them all across the city. They're pretty neat to see in person as well. There are some that are life-size. So um, do check those out. And I will stop sharing my screen um, so I can see all of the panelists and our moderator, just to thank them once again for being here this evening for this really amazing conversation. We're looking forward to part two, possibly. Um, I feel like there's so much that I feel like we could sit here all evening and just keep talking about public art, but we so appreciate you all being here this evening. Thank you to everyone who's watching, who's interacted in the chat. Um, I will definitely be saving the chat as well. Some great points were being made. Um, and again, we hope to see you soon at the Art Gallery of Windsor. Take care, everyone. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll see you soon for, for part two, hopefully. Take care, everyone. Thanks a lot, Sophie. Bye-bye. Awesome. Have a great night. See ya. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>